Então, é uma... É uma... Ah, we've been recorded. Michael is our, our security chief, if you like. Um, I'll let him say a little bit, a few words about, about what that means to him. But um, yeah, he's joined us part time. We don't have him full time. We want to try to get him a bit fuller than we have. And we're working on that. But for the moment, he's with us part time. Also, I think primarily working with with um, the company that runs Opera, the browser Opera. So, Michael, maybe I mean that's that's my brief intro of what I know. Maybe you want to. Yeah. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, quick intro about myself. I think that I managed to talk to not maybe many of you but at least some of you and uh, what probably you should know about me is that I've been doing security for the last 20 years. I am an engineer by education and primary interest for that so uh, I hope that I'm a quite a technical person to be able to support you and some uh, answer some really technical questions. At the same point of time, I've been working a lot on the, let's say, policy and process level of security. And uh, with uh, all this like complexity of issues, I think that I can help to uh, translate uh, formal uh, language of standards, uh, legislative requirements, um, or anything that is related to compliance, to security measures, and to help to reflect back whatever happens on the security side, on the practical side, to uh, to the pol policy level as well. I've been working as an auditor and penetration tester, so I understand how uh, attackers uh, think and uh, what are the most typical issues or the most typical uh, attack scenarios that uh, can happen. And uh, I've worked quite a lot on the protection side, uh, running systems at scale, uh, both as a system administrator and security administrator and security manager. So I also know a bit how it works from the backend side. The HS2 is uh, still a new world, uh, exciting world, uh, which I'm exploring uh, more and more every day. So there are a lot of things that I still don't know, but at least I hope that I get more and more on board uh, and I learned a lot of things from this year and I also rely on your expertise and knowledge to provide some feedbacks and hope I will be useful with mitigating security issues or helping to prevent them in the future. That's all from my side. Thanks, Michael. Um, it would be nice to go around for everyone to introduce themselves, but we've already got 11 people on, so we won't do that. Um, I can tell you just looking at all the names that what we have here is a smattering of people from from around the world who are responsible for system administration in their various countries. And of course, interestingly enough, we have Jamila joining us from his Western Central Africa, who I think is the first, well, perhaps after his South Africa is the, the, the first security appointment that we've seen in a HISP group. So we've got a bit of a mixture of mostly server admin people and one or two security people. Tato, I know, I don't know, Tato, are you, are you on the security side specifically or are you server admin in general? Yeah, Bob, I've moved to security, so that's my main focus. Yeah, it, it, it seems like a kind of there's there's a there's a division now in what used to be just one team. Yep. Yeah. Fractional, factionalism down south. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Michael, that's kind of who's here. Um, but I thought it would be interesting for them to to hear a little bit from you about. Um, the, your thinking around DHIS2 and approaches to managing it and installing it. And I also thought that they might have some interesting questions to, to ask you regarding best practices of security. 
So maybe, Michael, let's start there. I mean, security, DHS2, obviously is much, much more than just, just the back-end system administration stuff. But the back-end system administration stuff is obviously important as well. Um, how, do you, how do you break that down in your head in terms of security? I mean, what's the importance of system administration in that? Right, okay, so to begin with, uh, I think that everything like starts with the installation of the system. So even, uh, or once we have a product, uh, you can't have a lot of like, control over what happens within the software and we fully rely on the core team to develop the product, to develop the software. And once we get to the jar file, we are kind of left alone with the, what they have delivered. And uh, like the overall responsibility comes to system administrators and those who deploy the system actually. So it means that um, from security perspective, uh, you will be those who can either keep it running as secure as it is, or help the team to, um, let's say, work around the issues that will be discovered during, during the uh, use process. So it means that, for example, you have a default installation, you have followed the security manual or the best guide, the guide, the best practice for this platform or your Linux probably system, you deploy DHS2, and then you find out that uh, there is a, or you learn that there is a vulnerability in the system that requires an upgrade and upgrade can be performed. So you can introduce your workaround. And it means that the system administrators, the support team, they are mostly the first line of defense that can introduce some workarounds, do some patch immediately while the developer team are preparing the next version for upgrade or when the upgrade is not possible. So it means that it is a kind of a crucial level. It's a crucial first line of defense that we have if the application fails or may fail in certain security aspects. Oh. Michael, you're kind of lucky, I suppose, to have arrived when you had have. Because if you, if you looked in on this space, uh, maybe five or six years ago, some of the things that were being done were, were, would, would sort of make your skin crawl a little bit. The, the most common setup of DHIS2 would generally, would not be using SSL. Mm -hmm. um, very commonly would be running on an IP address. Um, and also, quite commonly, the Tomcat would be running as the root user. Um, that's kind of was the the state of play, <laughs> I guess, because a large part system administrators were not were not experienced. Often, they were just the most technical person at hand who was called in to do the job. And our documentation, I think, was very weak in terms of our implementation guidance. Um, so I, I think you can say we've come a fair way from those days um, in the sense that now most systems that you see um, at least don't have those very fundamental errors. And part of the way we address that was, well, you'll know, I, I started making these, these installation management scripts. Um, I say Stephen helped me out, in fact, on, on a couple of those. I think he's on the call. Um, and that was really a way of trying to inscribe some good practice into, into a normal installation so that you'd get reasonable security settings by default. But one thing we never did, um, we thought about doing, we never did, was actually write down what are those security, security controls that we are attempting to implement or to comply with. Um, and I think that's an area where you've got some thoughts on them, how we can marry our, our implementation tooling also with some kind of um, compliance or control list or something. Yeah. Uh, I would probably make one step back and say about a bit about what actually happened during the last years, uh, maybe not very noticeable for 
all who do system administration and who work with uh, Linux systems and their applications using Tomcat, Nginx, Apache, and other things like, like that. So we see that um, you mentioned that there is a quite a, a lot of good practice and uh, a lot of changes that we had in the past. They are related with some poor practices like running systems as root and uh, uh, under like opening uh, uh, having full access to the configuration file along the web server to modify configuration so on so on these are naturally part of the checklist that we have right now but a uh, security checklist that we recommend as our best practice but if you look at what has happened during the last years i think we came uh, from a kind of a chaotic uh, and uh, individual driven approach to some kind of a standardized environment where both operating system and applications and uh, supporting software like demons like network services and so on they have a kind of a recommended way of doing things i would like to invest a bit time into that right now because it is important to um, to get on this topic and understand how what what has changed and how we can benefit from that for example, um, and it's also tightly related to the topic of uh, security automation, running automated deployments and other things that we will hopefully discuss during this uh, session. So let's uh, take one very, very simple example, uh, which is um, SSH. So, uh, and maybe I will uh, try to share my screen and show you some configuration. So uh, just to make it very actionable and uh, easy to, to follow. So uh, let me find, uh, I made some preparation for this talk. So let me find what we have. Yeah. Well, Mike, no, we impressed you made some preparation. Yeah, yeah I, 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 like <laughs> I got to <laughs> something. Let me see. I will share my screen in a second. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not seeing uh, it. Yeah, not not yet. Just a second. Uh, I have too many tabs to share screen. Okay. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, oh, available. About right now. Try again. Okay. Uh, share my screen. Okay, that's much better. Right. Okay. So. We have uh, a host uh, which is called uh, security uh, dmarv dhs2.org, which is, uh, I think you can see my screen now. So, this is a test machine or kind of a machine for uh, checking DMARC records for our domain. Uh, it doesn't work as a DHS2 platform or something, anything related to the application itself, but it is uh, has a kind of a default configuration that I would like to show. And uh, we'll start with SSH. So uh, as a root user, I will go, um, do you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, to SSH and uh, to ETC folder, and here we have uh, standard folder for SSH configuration, which is uh, etc SSH. So if we look um, at the standard server config file, it is, as all we know, it is etc uh, SSH SSHD config. And this file exists for like ages. So this is the standard configuration ever. And the uh, the one of the typical things that we do as a part of the hardening, we disable password authentication. And to do so, we just configure this line. It is commented out by default. So it is password authentication. No, it, it doesn't have a common field. So if you would like to uh, disable plain text password authentication, and use all the security keys, SSH keys, you will just un uncomment this line. And uh, if we don't do that, uh, we are vulnerable to potential brute force and attacks. We uh, are possible about stealing, uh, we are vulnerable to the vulnerability to someone 
re reusing the shared password. And uh, from compliance perspective, it's a kind of additional burden to ensure that your system has an additional password policy and you have to maintain it. So using a search key is highly encouraged, encouraged and once you use a search key, you ha have it to configure in this way. If you would do this kind of action five years ago, you will just do it exactly as it is written here. So you'll just uncomment this line and uh, restart or reload a Sage server. Um, the problems that happen with this configuration are that, for example, you upgrade the version of SSH, you have automatic upgrades, or you just upgrade your system manually, and then uh, a configuration file changes. So you'll get a new version of this file, which will be saved in a different one. And uh, in fact, you have to maintain a difference between this file and the one you, you get with a new version of the daemon. Uh, if you have more changes, or if you would like to introduce them with some kind of automation tool, you need to literally make some changes with uh, Puppet uh, or Ansible or any other tool of your choice to edit this file in place and to ensure that your configuration doesn't interfere with other changes that are introduced in the file. This is a very simple example. Changing one line is pretty straightforward, but if you have a more complicated configuration, tracking these changes automatically and applying this configuration at scale can be quite troublesome and uh, the risk of error or risk of misconfiguration um, increases. Uh, SSH also has a quite tricky policy uh, with match rules. And if you have some match rules and would like to do different policies based on matching, it will be even more complicated. So if you do it with a SSH up to version six, I think, uh, or maybe even seven, you will be definitely doing it in this file. But the one of the most important changes that happened a year ago, roughly a year ago, is the line that now appeared here. And this line is including a snippet configuration. This is very similar to what Nginx does for years or what Apache does for years, but in SSHD, it appeared only a year ago. So in fact, instead of doing this uh, change, we should do a different command. So we'll take this rule. We do uh, So we create a file with a configuration, which will be looking like that. And now we also edit a SSHD config file and we return it to the original state, which was like this. Michael, can I ask a quick question? Sure, please. Uh, I mean, we do the same thing um, I know I advocate for years with the, with the Postgres configuration file. Yes. Right? So that you, it's, it's also just easy. This big, long configuration file, is also, it's easy to see what's the bits that you've changed. Yeah. <laughs> other things. Yeah, exactly. But the, but the interesting thing with Postgres is that when you, when you include the file, you do it at the end. And with Postgres configuration, it's the last setting that wins. Mm -hmm. But it looks like with SSH, the reverse seems to be true. Is that... Yeah, that's that that's a good catch. In fact, you include the all the changes. So let's uh, do before we do um, anything here, we will make one more action. In fact, if we look here, indeed, we include all the settings, custom settings uh, first, and then we have uh, default ones configured in the file. And if you see most of them, uh, with a very few exceptions they are enabled or they're disabled, right? So, or they are commented out. So in fact, uh, yeah. they consider that the default settings here, they should be good enough and whatever you would like to change should go first so that you will not override the defaults that they offer. Uh, typically, yes, you can, uh, but the whole concept of this is not to touch the main configuration file and put all the configuration you want in the code snippets that you have. And then the flexibility of using these snippets is that you are much easier with upgrades. You know you have a dedicated file 
that can be managed separately. You can just drop in this file when moving configuration from one server to another. And um, it is much more, um, I think, reliable in terms of um, potential upgrades, conflicts, changes with the uh, automated tools, editing the file, and uh, it simplifies the administration effort quite a lot. And then uh, we uh, probably would like uh, to see what yeah. will happen next. Yeah, and uh, as Bob mentioned, typically this configuration is done at the very end of the file, but for SSH, they decided to go the different way. They offer users to introduce their uh, changes first uh, and then, then uh, to apply defaults after that. So is it the first the first the first setting that wins or, or yes the yeah this right. is uh the first setting that wins and uh, it will be applied first as far as i remember yeah if port Larky is asking you something if you have some questions i'm, I'm i don't watch the the chat so if you have questions probably i need to look into into the chat as well port Larky? Can you can you ask your question in the flesh? In the flesh. Thanks, Bob. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to find out uh, can this default uh, be applied be applied for the password authentication? Just a question for Michael. Wait, I think uh, you were breaking up at least I was not able to. Uh, I think you were doing better in the chat. Now, yeah, yeah, what Potlarky was asking oh, yeah. is, can the, same, can the same be done for all the other defaults, for example? Yes, the yes. you no. can change, for example, the port uh, to put it on the hidden or not, not non-default port, of course. You can, you can do that. The options that are commented, you, you can do it with all the options, but those that are uncommented in the uh, main configuration file, they will be reused. And then once we uh, do this, uh, so we would like uh, to apply the changes, but another good practice that is highly encouraged and more and more services allow that, like Nginx for sure, uh, SSHD for sure, they uh, suggest you to test your configuration before you actually apply it. and. Uh, then we can do it like this. And it will say nothing. It means that the configuration is valid. For example, if we add another option here, which is a random option of my choice, and I try to test, it will say that there is a bad configuration option and it allows us to ensure that whatever we changed will be applied correctly. More and more tools have a validation of security options and uh, it is quite essential to test whatever you changed before applying. And I think it's a good rule for all kinds of changes. With Nginx, there is a config test option, the same for SSHD and many other tools allow to, let's say, have this kind of um, checking all the, all the time. So we revert back to the good configuration and uh, now we can test it once again uh, and then apply the changes. That's it. So back to back to the original question or to original topic. So there are a lot of things that have changed and now checking for security settings is much easier than before, especially if these settings are grouped and structured properly. And uh, we can benefit more and more while using standard approach to configuration and using standardized approach to um, making changes and deploying systems. So this is a kind of a major convenience that we see in the last years. And uh, that's why, uh, why we'll be creating and updating our security tools. We'll be trying to promote a good standard for making your configuration and uh, making it easy to, easier to maintain and easier to support later on. 
I'm Michael, can, can just a quick comment. Sure. I see that when you finished there, you did a reload of the SSHD. Yes. Um, there's always this question about, you know, should you restart or reload? <laughs> And, and it's not just the SSH, it's also whether you're making changes on the proxy or anything else. Yeah. Um, then one of the interesting differences with a reload, and I'm glad you did the reload there rather mm -hmm. than restart, is that it'll also test the configuration. And if the configuration is invalid, then it simply won't, won't load the new configuration settings. Yes. But the service will remain up. Yeah. Whereas if you'd restarted it with an invalid setting, then you would end up. You could end up with your SSH down. Yeah, that's correct. And I think that up to the very very recent versions, uh, it did not allow. So now I think even if you restart it, it will try to keep your current session. But lots of sysadmins in the past they applied the incorrect settings and got cut off from the, their systems. So yeah. we are explicitly using SSHD minus T to test it, and then we do reload just to to ensure that we are doing everything properly. Actually, actually, after that, we should go to the to the log file to see that the configuration has been successfully reloaded, even if we don't get any error message, as a kind of a best practice. But uh, this is a kind of a more more paranoia than like the regular thing. But I, I'm I'm pretty sure that quite quite a lot of you do this uh, on a regular basis, and this is already the part of your regular habits, uh, rather than something that you you would just learn and uh, say, okay, this is a kind of overhead. Over. Oh, oh well. I wouldn't take I wouldn't I wouldn't count on the fact that everybody always has the best of habits. Um, but it is interesting. I mean it's good starting with SSH and, and and people will know who've been on server academies that we do every now and again. Um, typically we I mean, it's always it's always a bit scary. I, I try to have a kind of barrier of entry to say that you know, people can be really familiar with SSH keys and things before they're allowed to show up. But the way the world is, people show up anyway and don't necessarily have it all in the background. So we will spend at least half a day typically talking about SSH. Um, so yeah, it's a good place to start. Um, I know. Stephen's got a whole presentation around weird and wonderful things you can do with SSH as well. I mean, once you once you get past the basics, the importance of using SSH for tunneling and um, its relationship with SCP and things like that, um, it's good. So, so beyond securing SSH, Michael, um, and would you would you suggest? Well, I'm sure you would. Um, automating that that configuration of SSH. I'm always a little bit nervous about automating configuration of SSH because I've been locked out so many times in my life that I trust myself better doing doing the initial steps manually. But yeah. I'm sure. I'm... Well, it depends. I would say that uh, if we look at the most uh, recent versions of SSH or Linux that are running, is running these versions, I think we are in a pretty safe situation and uh, it is quite reliable even if we fail. Uh, however, I, I would say that we should consider looking at least one or two ver major versions of the operating systems behind to ensure that we still have compatibility uh, and uh, our advice applies not only to those who is running the most recent fa fancy Ubuntu 22, but I'm pretty sure that some of you have uh, Ubuntu 18 or even Ubuntu 16 or equivalent systems that may have a bit different approach. So we still, uh, we always will have this compatibility uh, challenge. And uh, I, I would agree that some things probably should be configured manually or at least tested much more thoroughly than before, especially if we have a new version of Ansible, some scripts that were not tested on the very recent, uh, very old systems. So yeah, it, uh, it, it can be challenging even with all the automation that we have. Stephen has his hand up. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Hi, yeah, it might be worth just adding from uh, 
uh, additional security perspective that uh, there's a tool out there that's called fail to ban. And uh, one of one of the things it can do is it can watch things like your SSH logs. And if people are, you know, repeatedly trying to get into your system with failed passwords and all that kind of stuff, uh, it will actually put a record into the uh, the IP tables of the machine to block those kinds of accesses. I, I try to make use of those kinds of things a lot because, you know, you can have denial of service attacks and all kinds of other things, um, which which that tool can be used to block. Um, so I encourage anybody to, to look at that. Uh, the flip side is that uh, if people type in their, their own passwords wrong too many times or their key is wrong too many times, then you can lock yourself out. So again, sort of to Bob's point that uh, you, you should always have some additional way to get into a system if you run into issues. But uh, yeah, fail to ban can be useful. It can be useful against the Nginx and attacks on DHS too, as well as, as just an additional tool to look at. Yeah, uh, great comment, Stephen. Thank you. And I'm a great fan of fail to ban. And at the same point of time, uh, along with the issue that you can accidentally be locked out, um, uh, I faced a couple more interesting issues related to that. So if you, for example, install fail to ban on uh, public host and uh, there is quite a lot of, uh, let's say, malicious activity, uh, once trying to brute force password at scale and you don't have the log rotate configured properly, which sometimes happens. Exactly. Uh, the system will, uh, the logs, uh, and if you don't have uh, var partition properly partitioned and you don't have enough space there, which sometimes happens, uh, you can uh, simply run out of disk space with a lot of attempts of uh, brute forcing and fail to ban producing too much noise in the default configuration. Mm -hmm. This happens sometimes. And another story related to that is also kind of an unintentional abuse and denial of service is that if there are too many entries that um, are blocked and fail to ban is maintaining a huge table of uh, remote IPs that uh, try to connect, or the policies don't wipe them out uh, in a like, timed manner, uh, you can get a risk of the significant slowdown because oh, yeah, yeah. tables may, be, may get uh, quite huge. The table for IP tables can be quite huge. Yeah. And uh, for systems under, under high load, for example, if you have a mm -hmm. gateway for all these services, it may impact your performance badly. So this is another thing to consider, but otherwise it's a really good tool to use. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Uh, th thanks, Michael. Um, so moving beyond SSH, I mean, I, I, SSH is obviously we could we could spend the day on it. Yeah. Um, many many aspects of configuration and good practice, but in terms of of the way that we currently recommend DHS to is is installed on a system, um, you've had a go, I think, yourself at. Tito's Ansible scripts. Um, what's your prognosis there? Um, do you think it's a good way to go? Uh, is it something that you're planning to use for your reference implementation? And maybe tell us a little bit about what you mean by security reference implementation. Yes. So uh, answering to your question, the tools are great. And uh, I think that uh, uh, for person like me who tried them first time and uh, managed to install the uh, DHS2 in the full configuration like within roughly 40 minutes with some minor questions uh, and uh, answers from Tito uh, who happened to be in the same room uh, at the same time due to the pure coincidence. Uh, it was uh, very, very helpful. So uh, the tools are really great uh, and they are very versatile, very flexible. And uh, I think that while using them and trying them on different systems and platforms, we probably can work around the issues that we faced or may face in the future. So there is some work to be done to maybe to clean up the policies or to ensure that some corner cases are followed, but at least for the default setup, it worked pretty well. So, um, and uh, one more detour here, I'll tell about the reference setup a bit more and what we're trying to achieve with this implementation. So once uh, 
um, once we deploy DHS2 using the scripts, it, it is considered like a, a standard setup or one of the preferred or one of the possible ways of installing the system. And as we are not able to support all the platforms and all types of the installations, we uh, somehow concluded or almost concluded internally that we would like to maintain at least one validated and tested way of installing the HS2, uh, which is called the reference setup. And uh, we will try to use this setup for all kinds of security assurance tasks for penetration testing and uh, uh, like trying to um, provide a configuration that will be uh, secure by default and will be easy to test. So we call it a reference one. And uh, for this purpose, we will use uh, the DHS tools with the Ansible setup. And I can show what how 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 it works and what what is the whole goal. So uh, there is a virtual machine that we support uh, that we deployed in Oslo uh, OpenStack Cloud. Uh, we, it can be also deployed in AWS or any other cloud cloud environment. It can be a physical machine as well. But uh, the part of the setup is to ensure that it can be deployed fully automatically using the tools and uh, at any time uh, have the safe enough defaults and we'll test security setup with scanners, all kinds of aesthetic analysis tools and dynamic testing against this, this machine and ensure that it, uh, it is secure enough. It's also the way to test in the real life uh, that the tools are working properly and we can recreate this configuration with Ansible at any time at the provided that we have default uh, operating system, fresh, uh, freshly installed and, and so on. So long story short, uh, we have Ubuntu machine. Uh, it's uh, I think Ubuntu 20 or 22 and uh, it uses a vanilla image. So just the operating system from installed with the minimum tools. And uh, then uh, probably I will show my screen again. Uh, let me find uh, the script. So in fact, uh, we... opens. yeah, let me share my screen. Yeah, Michael, Tito took us through the installation process last week. Yeah, I will not go through the installation process related to the tools themselves because it was really covered uh, before, but I will show the part that is not uh, the, that is not in scope of that for sure, and uh, we'll see if you have any feedback and comments on that. Well, there's also lots of people here who weren't there, weren't here last week anyways. Yeah, yeah I, I'm pretty sure that uh, people can add uh, or comment on what I did because it was uh, probably not uh i think it what you discussed was but when I, when, once i have a fully running system and i will go one step behind and we'll share the screen and show something different right uh so everything is public uh we have uh, a different uh, github uh, organization which is called dhs2 uh, sre uh, such a reliability engineers where we put all the scripts for internal internal deployment and uh, we have uh, the repository called uh, DHS2 Specimen. I can also send a link to the chat if you'd like to explore it uh, by yourself. And uh, I need to find the chat here. Oh, messages. Right. And uh, in fact, we have uh, two scripts. One script. Uh, is uh, this one, which is called user data sh, and this is a script that comes to the virtual machine configuration. So it, it is stored in the metadata of the virtual machine, and uh, it does only two things, it or three things. It updates the repositories, it installs wget, and it runs one of the our bootstrap script uh, using the uh, wget and uh, bash uh, piping. So this uh, this is the whole thing there. And once we reboot or recreate this machine, it will 
just trigger this uh, script and uh, the configuration will be downloaded. And what happened next, we have a bootstrap script that actually performs all the necessary actions. And uh, this bash script is just using Ansible to create certain, uh, to create uh, the HS2 deployment. So you all are aware about how work with Ansible. So I'll just tell about missing, missing parts. So here we just set up a full domain automatically. This is a standard setup uh, recommended way of uh, getting the host name and setting the host name. And uh, these are lines from 10 to 15. Then we install additional necessary uh, packages that are needed before you can launch uh, Ansible. And uh, then we configure firewall. Uh, these things were like missing from, I think from the default setup. Mm -hmm. So these are the necessary steps on the default system. Then we configure SSH in the same way as I explained a bit earlier. And this is not the part uh, of the like original policies for the host machine because all the configuration happens in, in the virtual container environment. Then we install Ansible, it was recommended, and uh, download the server tools and make some changes to the configuration. So the only settings that I have changed are time zone. Uh, I prefer to use UTC everywhere because it's a kind of a standard for systems. And uh, I just add the email FQDN and I update the OS version with the one that we run, okay. not hard coding it. And uh, that's uh, pretty much all. Uh, there are some action items to be added, like IPv6 configuration if needed, uh, using the latest version of the DHS2 in the tools. And uh, then we just deploys, deploy the playbook for LXD setup as prescribed by Tito in the, in the manual. That's uh, pretty much all. And if you run it uh, on any, or at least we would like to not guarantee, but to ensure that if you run this setup on any uh, recent Ubuntu server, you will get the system without any problems from scratch. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I, I got a few comments I could make on it, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take it up with you afterwards. Small things. But we only have 10 minutes left, so maybe instead of hearing from me, Let's see if we've got any other questions from the participants that they want to put to you about this or anything else. And Stephen, we'll give you a go and we'll just see if anyone else puts their hand up first, otherwise it's you. Yep, Stephen, off you go. Okay. Um, I, I, I've been experimenting with the Ansible scripts and they really look great for, uh, for deploying DHS2 on... Um, you know, either on a bare metal machine or in a virtual machine or something. I was wondering, given that you're working on this this reference security implementation, which also sounds fantastic, um, what the role of the Docker images are that Oslo is providing for DHS2? Because I actually, I'm, I'm sort of lazy and I make use of the Docker images a lot, uh, not only because they're sort of self-contained and I know that they work or I assume they work because doc uh, Oslo is packaging them, but I'm able to wrap them with things like, you know, Jolokia to ma to watch uh, JVM messages, and I have Telegraph, and I use things like console and other things to pass, you know, passwords and things secret securely in a lot of my deployments. And um, I'm wondering, like, I guess it's two questions. One, are you going to do a reference implementation of a secure deployment of DHS2 in a Docker image as well? And what do you see the role of the Docker images be being for the you know, maybe even beyond just development, but in a more production type setting. Okay, that's a, a kind of a very discussional question. Um, so um, I would say that we started with containers because it was actually one of the, maybe I wouldn't say simpler, but it was one of the historically first implementations after the manual setup without like with the containers happened. So 
Um, I don't have strong preference, but the setup with, con with containers was, was already in place, and we decided to like to have a kind of an MVP for this reference setup. We decided to go with container uh, with uh, LXC containers first. So uh, I know that uh, we have Docker images, but I haven't tried them by myself yet. And uh, probably it will be the next step to deploy another similar host with a Docker configuration. Mm -hmm. um, it's likely the next one on the agenda. Maybe we would like, we suggest to use your experience or to have some extra services uh, included, but another like part of it is that, for example, I would love to have console included mm -hmm. for service discovery. But uh, for me, it's a it's a very useful thing, but it's a, a bit more custom or a bit more specific mm -hmm. rather than uh, the product itself. And uh, it may cause if we would like to make a secure setup and a kind of something that we are not uh, providing a guarantee, but at least feel more confidence. It will require more work on our side to maintain the setup and like give uh, professional advice about that. So we are starting quite slow with this. So, and we would like to have more configurations, but at least for now, we will stick to uh, one version of Ubuntu, one uh, set up with containers. Mm -hmm. And if we have a bit more time, we'll try to deploy it with Docker uh, or maybe even Kubernetes and uh, see how it works and test and provide some security advice for that. But or as a second priority only. Okay. Well, if you guys do get, do get around to that with uh, with Docker and you know looking at either using uh, Alpine or Slim or whatever you're currently using as your your OS and doing a reference implementation at Dockerfy, I'd love to help because it's uh, it, it's an all other way of deploying things. That often is it's easier to use in a pipeline for sort of continuous integration and delivery where you might not just want to put DHIS2 up, you might want to do other things, you know, and often more and more, I think DHIS2 is living in an ecosystem of other products. It gets really complicated. I, I feel for you because like you're trying to solve things at the OS level. So people have an easy way to install things, but then it's, it's, it's hard to figure out where to draw the line, you know, in yeah. terms of trying yeah. to solve things. But uh, Docker, uh, Docker should be on the agenda for sure. I'm like very, very careful with giving any promises here because we would like at least to get some kind of a full cycle of deployment and review. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we are still in the deployment phase. It's like ready for testing. We'd like to go with one route of te testing. And for example, adding Docker will, from, from my perspective, will also be a kind of a stress for system admin administrators who haven't worked with it before. Uh, so, and security in Docker requires quite a lot of knowledge of the platform itself and quite a lot of understanding of the things under the hood, which for me is a kind of a next level of complexity after containers. Yeah. So, okay. thank yeah. you. Yeah, Steve, I think Docker is in our future for sure. It's it's in our present, in fact. Um, one of the issues we face with, I guess, is the security management of those Docker images, and that's currently what holds us back at the moment for recommending people take those images and run them in production. I mean, I think you've seen that disclaimer on the website yourself when you download yeah. the image. And the problem with images, they go stale. And unless you've got a security management plan around them, then um, you're potentially going to find yourself hit with zero day vulnerabilities. Um, and I think I, I think we we probably will reach a stage eventually where we can provide proper security management around the images. But I mean, for the moment, one of the benefits of doing of using containerization using the likes of NXT, for example, is that you can make use of the package manager. Um, we could already do Alpine, of course, and that's actually a good idea, making some lightweight containers mm -hmm. based on Alpine. Um, just running Tomcat makes, makes good sense. But yeah, I, I, I think we've, we've some work to do. Yeah. And I think others have as well, to be honest. I think I saw, some, I saw something recently about at least 50% or more of Docker images available for download have some kind of security vulnerabilities in them, critical. Um, and that's the situation we want to avoid. 
Yeah. The, the thing about the thing about Docker images, though, is even you know if, if a Docker image has an SSH vulnerability, for example, like I, I don't know who would put SSHD in a Docker image, but maybe somebody does. You don't expose that to the outside world, right? You you only expose the port that you need to expose. And and the nice thing about Docker is often if you look at what most Docker files invoke running, it's almost nothing. It's like just your code, you know, Tomcat plus JVM plus your software, which that's kind of the best possible scenario, you know. But at the same time, you're right. You need to wrap it with things that are that make it all secure. Otherwise, you could run into you could run into your other sets of issues. Um, you need to keep you need to keep your JVM up to date in the case of a Tomcat. Absolutely, insurance. absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Anyone else want to get in the last three minutes of Michael's time before we leave you get on with your day? People have been sitting quiet. Michael, I think you you stunned them all into silence. No, no, really, I, <laughs> I don't believe so. Uh, um, we, I, I'm sure we we are impressed with with, with what he had done and probably looking at his script actually um, looking at it for the point where it starts with the open stack i've never deployed one yet but then we'll like to get a taste of every bit of it and see what is best for us and there are a couple of comments that i've already made on Tito's deployment i don't know if those have been taken care of in your own script um, um michael so I, I don't know, but probably um, Tito will share that or he had shared it with you, so you know. Yeah, that. I haven't looked into the recent comments yet, but uh, we'll do some internal sync up because I also have some comments for Tito for follow up. So we'll make a session maybe next week or after the holidays and uh, get into that for sure. And if you have any feedback or if you would like to test uh, some of the scripts or you find some incompatibilities or improvements, uh, both Tito, Bob and I will be extremely grateful for sharing them either on the Telegram channel or submitting as a change request. So everything uh, will be counted in and uh, we like can't prepare like really good to set up without your help because you are on the ground, you know, it's much better than us. I like trying things, so don't worry. Bob will tell you <laughs> and Tito will tell you, so don't worry, I will try uh, and okay. just give you feedback. We know you, Gerald. <laughs> always, always good to have you sharing text. Okay, guys, I think it's 10 o'clock. Um, thanks, Michael, for joining us. Feel free to join us every, every other Thursday as well. Um, I'm not sure yet whether we're going to run next week or not. I know we're getting a bit close to Christmas, um, but I'll check that out with Tito and Alice um, and let you guys know shortly. What we are planning to do after Christmas, at least, is to... We're going to change the time a little bit. We're going to go a little bit later, I think around... Um, two hours later than this. Um, and we're going to open it up a bit. At the moment, it's a little, this is a little bit of a closed community that we just started out doing the, like, the first three sessions. So it's not very widely known, but it's going to be announced in the newsletter and we'll put something on the cop. So we'll be talking to a much wider audience in January. But I'll let you know shortly whether we're going to do anything next week or not. Otherwise, thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining Thank again you. this week. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I saw, I saw the postman. Okay, I'll go, Chris. I started doing this. I only had time to get